Okay, welcome back. This is chapter six, and chapter six is about toys. Finally, we get to do toys. Okay, it's actually access control, firewalls, and VPNs. So there's some learning objectives on page 326. Are pretty cool. One of them is the the three-factor authentication. You probably heard that. It may even be abbreviated, 3FA. Cool stuff. We're going to talk about firewalls. There's lots of different types, although quite frankly, only a couple of them are really in use. And then virtual private networking, VPN. Okay, so as an introduction, they talk about, you know, the, these things are called, you know, technical controls, right? I mean, they're not pieces of paper, they're not policy, they're, you know, tangible things. But they're only part of the big solution. And quite frankly, you know, the, the controls part is actually the easy part. I mean, you, you buy a box, you know, you plug the box in, you configure the box, and you go on about your merry way. It was kind of fun setting it up, and uh, but that's just part of the problem, right? I mean, part of the solution. There's a heck of a lot more to it than just playing with toys. So the first thing you talk about is access control. Now, again, now we're talking about, I mean, an example of access control could be like just a plain old Windows system where you have permissions set on, on folders, right? Not, not a big deal. <clears throat> okay, so an access control list. Um, so an access control list basically is that list. That, I mean, I, and these are acronyms and they pronounce them ACLs and DACLs and SACLs, uh, whatever, dude. Anyway, an access control list basically says who and then what you know, and then what can they can do, right? You know, who, where, and what? You know, Bob had, on this folder has read permission. That kind of stuff, It again, this is not too complicated. We've talked about this before, but let's go through it again. A discretionary access control list. I think that's a horrible term because it makes it sound like, well, I can use the access control list or not. I mean, it's completely discretionary. That is not at all what they mean. What they mean, the discretionary part, is the owner of the folder is the one who gets to decide what the permissions are. Now, you would think uh, owners would be smart and they'd be using the correct kind of permissions. Uh, really? You think users are smart? Have you been in this business? So yeah, discretionary could cause some problems. The opposite of that is called a system uh, access control list, a SACL. And these are the ones that are set at by like, like at the administrator level and users don't have any anything to say about it. And the example that we use a lot is not you know read and write permission because in the Windows system all read and write permission is essentially discretionary. Okay. Uh, but the things that are not in a Windows based system is things like auditing or I turn on auditing for a particular folder and the user has nothing to do with this. They can't turn it off, they can't change anything. Right, cool. All right, and then there's role-based access, con access control. Now this is not really a new category. What they're basically saying is whenever you apply permissions to uh, a, you know, a folder, don't do it by people's names. You know, if the counting people need access to this shared folder on a network, then create a, a, a group called accounting members or something and put all the people in there. Don't go through and say, okay, Bob, Sally, you know, just list them all the employees. That is a pain in the butt and a waste of time. You probably need to just put all those people in a group and set the security at the group level. That way, when people come and go, all you have to do is make sure that the new people got put into the list and the old people got taken out. You don't have to do anything else. You don't have to go through and reset permissions because the permissions are already set and they're set based upon the role and not the individual. Okay. So um, on figure 6-2 uh, in the book, I'm not going to show it because you've, you've seen all this stuff before. Come on. You've, you've brought up properties on a folder and, and gone to the security tab and looked, haven't you? Yeah, I think so. Um, it basically just says, you know, here's the stuff. Well, I'll doggone it. <laughs> Rather than talk about it, let's, okay, let's just go here and we'll go to my desktop and we'll go to this and let's bring up the properties and let's go to security. And there, that is an access control list where Emmett Gray 
it's got all these permissions and administrators have all these permissions and the system has all these permissions. Okay, cool. All right, let's continue. So they talk about the uh, access control mechanisms on page 329. And so really we're talking about, uh, well, okay. So access control, the big picture, what is access control? And then there's non-discretionary, which is the system one. And then there's discretionary, controlled by the user. And then it could be, you know, role-based or mandatory. I don't really, that this distinction is not all that important. In fact, I don't particularly like this, this idea. Any one more, one more time. Having an access control matrix means you have a list of roles down here and a list of, of resources and whether, and then so roles and resources and like on an Excel spreadsheet and you go through and say, oh, this guy gets read or this group gets read, they get right over here and they get read over here and they get right over here. You know, it's just a matrix. This is an excellent idea because if somebody comes in to review your security, you just whoop out this little piece of paper and say, well, here's how we set permissions on our all folders. And it works, kind of cool. So uh, the next thing they talk about is authentication factors. Now, now pay attention because this is a little weird. Um, so when we get to that point, yeah. All right, there's a bullet list on, on page 330 talking about the four fundamental functions of access control. Okay, cool. And the, uh, the, the functions are, I need you some way to authenticate. I, you know, I am the person I, who I say I am. Um, I can prove that I'm that person. So I say I'm Bob, I can prove it. And then here's what I can do now that you know who I am. Like, okay. And then I can track all these things. Now, this is kind of sort of important. Um, the idea is that uh, the identification piece is is kind of weird. Um, it could be something like you know username and password, right? You know I know who I, who you are because you're logged into that system. That's one way of doing it. Uh, typically, that's not enough though. Typically, we need more different types of of authentication. So here's where we talk about the three factor authentication. So three factor is how many factors would that be? Four? Two? Oh, three? You mean it's called three factor because there's three factors? Wow, what a coincidence. Okay, so one of them would be something that you know, like you know your name and you know your password. That's one. Uh, something that you physically have with you, like an access control card. That's two. And then third one is something that you are, some biometric like facial recognition or thumbprint or something, retinol something that basically that only you have something that you that is unique to you okay so those are three factors now if you only had one of those factors how many factors would that be one right okay good so i'm going to show you a very simple um clip from uh, a tv show uh and watching a video on youtube via a video on youtube is a little weird but just bear with me so this is, uh, I guess I gotta go through that part. This is Bing Bang here. This building was classified. Maybe that's because it's classified. <laughs> Wish we weren't so far from my parking space. The way you put away those lemon bars, perhaps that's a good thing. <laughs> I'd like to reinstate the you not talking rule. Why? It clearly doesn't work. <laughs> I guess this is it. Is that a retinal scanner? Let's find out. <laughs> Howard Wallowitz, access granted. No! Oh, my turn, my turn. Leonard Hofstetter, access granted. I didn't even have to take my glasses off! <laughs> access denied. Okay, the point of this is Facial recognition and iris and retinal scans are great, but in this particular case, that's the only thing letting them in that door. They don't have to have something that they know, like a name or password or a pin. They don't have to have something that they have, like a card. All they have to have is that. So how many factors is that? That's one factor, okay? One factor. Kind of makes sense. Okay. So the authorization piece on page 333. 
So authorization, you could do authorization individually. I don't recommend it. Most likely by group, okay? But what happens if you have multiple systems? Now, this gets a little complicated. If you have a you know, homogeneous system, like all you have is like Windows-based systems and you're using Active Directory, then an account built on one, you can kind of have it appear everywhere. But if you're like in a business relationship with another company and you don't necessarily have an Active Directory trust, that's what the thing's called, then I basically have to come up with a list of people on the, in from company A which are allowed to come into company B. So it's a little more complicated than just normal. Okay, so there's a thing called a chain of trust, and you've probably heard of this before. And it basically is, if I trust Bob and Bob trusts Sally, therefore I must trust Sally, right? It's a chain of trust. So if I say company A is okay, and then company A says Bob is okay, then I'm gonna say Bob is okay. That's how the chain of trust works. Okay, accountability. So the accountability point is all about, I'm gonna record every single time you do this, every single time you attempt to log in, every single time you successfully log in, I'm gonna record the date timestamp and the where on the planet you physically are. I mean, I'm gonna record all this information. Okay, good. So it provides an audit trail. And this comes in really handy if you're trying to defend yourself or you get caught doing something stupid. It's like, who was there at two o'clock in the morning? Well, looks like Bob logged in. Okay. Biometrics on page 334. Now biometrics are fun, just like the YouTube clip here. I mean, it's hilarious, it's fun, it's great to play with, but in reality, it's kind of gimmicky. I mean, really? Um, it's an emerging technology, and to tell you the truth, Hollywood kind of overhypes this big time. I mean, I've seen lots and lots of movies where their three-factor authentication is laughable. Okay, and the reason is, is there any ambiguity whatsoever in somebody typing in a name and a password? I mean, either you typed it incorrectly or you didn't, right? There's, there's no guesswork. So is there any ambiguity on, on whether or not you plugged in a security card or something? No. Is there any ambiguity of, of uh, facial recognition? What if you had an identical twin? Well, there might be some ambiguity there, right? I mean, it could be a gray area where you might get a false positive or a false negative involved, right? It's possible. Okay, so they talk about on the false accept rate and the false reject rate. There's an entire little term list here. Um, so basically it talks about uh, the, the false accept rate, a rate in which a fraudulent user is allowed. A false reject means I am authorized, but it told me no. And then this crossover error rate. This is a term that the biometric people use. That basically means is, you know, where does the false uh, accept and false reject meet? That point, and if that point is acceptable, in other words, 90% of them, you know, of, of it is good and only 10% fall into those two other categories, you know, that crossover rate. So this is clearly not 100%. Hey, um, if you have an identical twin, can they uh, open your, uh, your iPhone with Face ID? Probably. What about identical twins? Do they have absolutely identical fingerprints? Uh, it turns out, no, they have very, very similar fingerprints, and quite frankly, a, a very simple fingerprint reader probably won't be able to tell them apart, but technically, no, they're not absolutely identical. Okay, so palm prints, that's a good one. You know, you put your hand down and it scans your palm. That's a good one, right? It kind of makes sense, unless, of course, you get sunburned or you hurt yourself. See how this is kind of ambiguous, right? Hand geometry, that's another one that basically, you know, looks at the, the lengths of your fingers and, and all that stuff and the widths and stuff, but you know, maybe you're working out, maybe you were sick, right? You, you see the ambiguity? Okay, we're coming up on the 15 minute mark, so let's, uh, let's pause this and pick it up in a second.